Hey there, vinyl lovers, listen up. It's time to take your vinyl experience to the next level with Sidetracked Workshop. Sidetracked Workshop has gorgeous handcrafted record storage, exquisitely cool turntable furniture, all made with beautiful hardwood out of the USA. Sidetracked Workshop blends style, functionality, and durability. You spend a small fortune on records, don't keep them in a crate. Store and display in style with a console or cabinet from SidetrackedWorkshop.com. Elevate your vinyl setup at SidetrackedWorkshop.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to The Vinyl Guide, the podcast for record collectors and music nerds. Here's your host, the biggest record nerd of them all, Nate Goyer. Ah, well, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 470 of The Vinyl Guide, the podcast for record collectors and music nerds. And ladies and gentlemen, today we have the absolute honor of welcoming to the show Mr. Steve Diggle of The Buzzcocks. Now, today, Steve's going to take us on a journey through the early days of punk rock, uh, from seeing Sex Pistols in Manchester to creating the iconic Spiral Scratch EP. Uh, He's going to share stories behind their music, the rare recordings, their record labels, the lasting legacy of punk rock, as Steve discusses in his new book, Autonomy. And of course, Buzzcocks continued influence today, as evidenced by their recent shows with Descendants, no effects and other bands who claim Buzzcocks as a major influence. And by the way, Buzzcocks are buzzing through Australia here in the coming weeks. Uh, Brisbane, Adelaide, Fremantle, Newcastle, Sydney, Melbourne, Lorne, and Castle, Maine. Tickets and details at buzzcocks.com. And hey, if you like punk rock, well, we've got plenty of other episodes and interviews with punk legends and the records they made, including episode 461 with Henry Rollins, talking collectible records and more. That's episode 461 of The Vinyl Guide. Al Barril of SSD and X Claim Records, discussing those wonderful Boston hardcore rarities, episode 456. The Saints, Ed Cooper and Mud Honey's Mark Arm, joined us to talk early Brisbane punk records, episode 455. Dimitri Coates of Off discussed their grand finale, free LSD, record and movie, and what's next for the band, episode 459, and literally hundreds more interviews. So, Follow our goddamn podcast in your podcast app. Hit that little checkbox that says follow and you'll be able to download and enjoy any of these episodes anytime you want. Well, all righty, without further delay, let's get on the horn with Mr. Steve Diggle of Buzzcocks. Hello, Steve. Boy. Ah, you're looking good. You look like you just got off the golf course. (laughs) <laughs> it was the closest thing I could find. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of gold, really. <laughs> uh, that's all right. We we, we don't publish Golf the video. For- this is just for you and me. You could you could yeah you, you could show up without a shirt. It's going to be fine. Um, right. So, <laughs> so Steve, that's a good shirt. It's it is. Funny. That looks very good. Um, certainly better than what I got on. Steve, uh, just want, let me get the, let me get the plugs out of the way here real quick. Buzzcocks coming to Australia just a few weeks. You're, you're getting ready. You, is your stuff already packed yet? Um, not yet. Uh, we just got back from uh, America. So, Mm -hmm. uh, going to do some washing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, that shirt doesn't look like it's laundry day. Somebody has. All right. Buzzcocks in Australia, October and November. Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Newcastle, Sydney, and Melbourne. Of course, you can get those tickets at buzzcocks.com. See those dates. And the new book, Steve Diggle, Autonomy, Portrait of a Buzzcock. It's available in some parts of the world, other parts it's not, but uh, you could hop on wherever books are sold. And if you can't get one right away, then you could pre-order it and it'll get to you at the earliest possible opportunity. Steve, I've been reading this book. Great book. Congratulations on this book. The story of your life, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> it's kind of, um, yeah, I mean, the book publishes really what the yeah, story of my life rather than uh, a lot more detail about the music, really, you know. The man behind the music kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it does a very good job of painting the story. There's one There's one thing that I, I thought was really funny because, uh, well, there's a lot of areas that I thought were largely entertaining, but this one in particular, because people always say punk rock started as a reaction to people getting sick of the progressive rock and the the, the extravagant 
organ solos and things like that. But you literally had that experience. It was like a lightning bolt after you, you, you saw Yes with Rick Wakeman, and it made you very frustrated. Yeah? Um, well, yes. Um, not only that, there was a guy called Patrick Morant that replaced Rick Wakeman. Mm-hmm. And um, he was uh, at the Free Trade Hall, and um, he had a bank of keyboards, like a telephone exchange of keyboards. And um, he was doing all these blips and bleeps, which were all kind of meaningless at that point. And um, then he brought an alpine horn out, the length of the stage. And I thought, something's got to change, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, something's got to change. And from then on, you know, I, I, I started thinking about, you know, three-minute songs, smashing the equipment up in my mind and uh, things like that, you know. Um, a more direct approach to music, you know, which became punk, which became punk rock, yeah. Now, had you now you you stumbled upon the Sex Pistols at the Manchester Free Trade Club show? You you weren't supposed to be there. You kind of got pulled in. A very amusing story we can go into. But you hadn't heard about punk rock up till that point. Were you, did you hear the term? Were you familiar with it at all? Um, not particularly. No. Um, I mean, there, were, there was no punk rock in 1976, really, um, or, or at the beginning. Or, um, I mean, what happened was. Um, one of the other guys had met the Sex Pistols in, in London, brought them to Manchester, and um, and uh, put a poster up. It was Howard or Pete, and uh, and um, I was still outside the free trade hall, and Malcolm McLaren, the Pistols manager, said they're inside. So I was arranged to meet some guy outside the free trade hall to go to a bar around the corner. So it was all fate, really. But, um, but also, I was... Um, I was going to form this band and do the three-minute songs, like uh, I said earlier, and um, that was um, that was my plan. And then I bumped into the other two, I was introduced to them, and um, we got on well. And then um, that became the Buscots. Um Strange coincidence, you know. Incredible <laughs> work of fate. Incredible yeah. coincidence. And uh, mm. Malcolm McLaren, I guess he was always. A salesperson, I guess he was just trying to get yeah. you inside. I think he was just trying to get you to what was a a poorly well, attended no. show at that point. Yeah. Well, you, well, yes, it was poorly attended, and um, he was also into that you know sort of French dar dar situationist thing where you know it creates situations in a way. You know, um, mm-hmm. and um, he ins- well, I said I'm forming a group, and I think Pete and Howard. Uh, uh, they was expecting somebody else, you know. They put an ad in a paper. I'd answered an ad in another paper. And um, so the person they were supposed to meet and the person I was supposed to meet, they're probably still waiting outside the free trade hall now. <laughs> somebody, somebody should go and tell them it's not happening. <laughs> well, it's funny because in so, your book, you actually you, you reveal, I think for the first time, that the person actually did call you back. You went out for a beer with the person. That you were supposed oh, to meet originally. Oh yes, I did eventually. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but um, we'd already well, we'd already booked a rehearsal. I think. I mean, the next day we rehearsed as the Buscots or three of us through this little lamp, and um, mm-hmm. and that was the beginning. Of it. And then uh, I think the day after, I met the guy, you know, and um, realized that uh, it, that it wouldn't work with that guy anyway, you know. Yeah, and I kind of said, um, I, I've just uh, met these other guys. It's uh, going to be called the Buzzcock, so um, I'll see how that. I kind of said, I'll see how that goes. You know, <laughs> he's still waiting by the phone, by the way. He's still uh. waiting by the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the name Buzzcocks was already there. It wasn't something that you were part of that conversation. Uh, it, it, Pete and Howard had already sorted that band name out. Yeah, it was actually Howard. He, um, there was a review for a TV show called Rock Follies, which was about three girls in the 70s trying to make it in a, in a rock band. Mm-hmm. And, um, in the local paper, it said, uh, you know, Rock Follies is on, so have a have a good buzz, hyphen, Cox. So I think in a, a cock up north in, in, in England was um, like friend, buddy, you know, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it just said have a 
have a buzz hyphen Cox, you know, enjoy the show kind of thing. And um, and how I think it was John John the two words together and said, "Oh, buzz Cox," you know. So mm-hmm. it was him that uh, that did that. And uh, funny enough, Howard only did ten shows. It is after all. <laughs> It was only 10, because I know he was there for six months, so you guys only did 10 shows with Howard during that time? Yes, yeah. It was oh. 10 shows, and he was only there for six months, amazingly. But he coined the phrase, and uh, he effectively started the band and then left kind of thing. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, so w- when Howard announced he was leaving the band, I know that you and Pete uh, you know, said, okay, we're, we're continuing on. Was it, what, did you try to talk him into staying, or there was no opportunity for that? Well, no, yes. Um, Actually, he was still at college doing his uh, finals, uh, finals, uh, but his degree was soon. And also, he said, I've done what I've uh, wanted to do, which was uh, we made Spiral Scratch the independent record ourselves, 500 pounds, made a thousand singles. And that was, uh, you know, people loved that. And, um, you know, he got good reviews and everything in all the papers. So we was kind of on the map, you know, a little step on the map. So I just happen to have one of those here. Right. This is They're the, very precious. It is. It wow. is. It's very yeah. precious. Um, I imagine you have a few of these at home stashed away, yeah? I No, not really. No, I'm not even sure where I've got one now in the original one. Oh, <laughs> you want to buy mine? <laughs> yeah, mine too. <laughs> i tell you what, when you get to Australia, this is yours. This is yours. Right. Um, so yeah. question, question for you. This Now, the sleeve... I understand. Now, our show is for record collectors, right? Yeah. And I understand the first set of sleeves were actually hand-assembled. Um, there yeah. was a batch of them that you guys had to put them together yourself. Is that right? That's right. Um, what happened was, um, yeah, they came in a plain sleeve, and um, all the band had to take it out of the plain sleeve and put it in that picture sleeve, you know. Okay. So. That drove me and Pete crazy. We kept nipping to the pub around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so, w- were there any sleeves where you had to glue them? Any, like, really oh, put no. them together? No? No, the sleeve was all came already made. But it was in one of them plain, plain sleeves, and we had to put it in the picture sleeve. Well, when you're doing a thousand, when you're 20 years old, that seemed a lot to us, you know. <laughs> Incidentally, with that sleeve, of course, the picture on the front, we had a Polaroid camera and we had two films. So the first picture first picture that was taken, I think uh, Howard had his eyes closed. So we had one picture left, um, <laughs> you know, one piece of film. And that became the picture. We had two goals at this. The first one didn't work out and that was, the second one did. So thank uh-huh. goodness it did. Wow. Okay. So you had two two opportunities for a picture, and the first one was blown by Howard. And so everyone's holding their mm-hmm. eyes open for the second one, I bet. Well, exactly. It's like, we've got to make it on this picture. <laughs> <laughs> we've, only, we've only got two films. <laughs> now, now, back in the day, you guys had a thousand of these. How did you distribute yeah. them? How did you get them out? Did you, you, you the band distribute them? Did you put them on gigs? How did they get out there? Yeah, and the idea was we 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 uh, we we'd, pl- we'd played a few gigs, and um, we was gonna sort of sell them at the gigs. Really, you know, it was like we we'd done a, a few shows, and we thought it'd be great if somebody, if we could hear ourselves. So we went and recorded this, and um, you know, it'd be great to sell them at the gigs. That was the idea. So we sold some of the gigs and stuff, and then. Jeff Travis from uh, Rough Trade Records, he phoned up and said, you know, I could, I've could, i got distribution, I could take over this thing. So he actually pressed more up, you know. But I think initially that thousand went pretty quick. But he continued then via Rough Trade to distribute these things, you know. Right, okay. Yeah, it was just that, you know, we thought, we're not really a record company. We didn't have any distribution things. So, you know, it was just to hear ourselves and send it to a few local fans. That was the idea. Yeah. Mm. You, 
You weren't sure. You you didn't even have in mind you'd get a bigger record deal or anything like that. It was just a bit of a band. No, project. exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, even, even then, it wasn't a record deal with that. It was just like he said he'll distribute those things because he like, kind of had a shop and stuff and a distribution network. So, yeah. um, so it was like, well, okay, you know, alleviate of this thing, you know. <laughs> And the 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 record label New Hormones. Do you know how mm. that name was selected? Um, that may come from the manager Richard Broom. Okay, I think so. I'm, I'm not 100 percent soon. It would have been Howard or Richard Broom at that moment. Yeah. All right. Well, this is again very uh, very precious record to me. But uh, you come down here to Australia, I'll make sure you. Uh, you 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 have one in your hands. Yeah, I mean, I've probably got one somewhere. It's just a, I can't believe I haven't held on to it. It's probably <laughs> an ex-wife or girlfriend got the original one. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But yeah. things happen when, when you part- move on from girl, girlfriends in the time. You know um, what? That made you a lot of singers. Well, that you you that that may have been a good deal for you if all it cost you was a couple of records. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so hey, back in the day, did you get mm. copies? Was, do you remember if there was test presses of Spiral Scratch? Did you guys get a test at all that you got to play before they made all the thousand? Um, yes, there would have been. Um, I remember hearing the test press, and yes, but um, I don't know what happened to it. You know, there was probably one test press in between all four of us and stuff. So um, I don't know who's got that. <laughs> all right. Um, or whether it still exists, you know. Yeah. You never know with things in that along the way. <laughs> there might be one somewhere. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that'd be fun. If you if you find one of those in a box, you let me know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, throughout the Buzzcocks and even your solo work, did you get a lot of test presses? Did, did you did you hang on to those sort of things? Uh, not really, but I have got. Um, I did a solo album about, about four or five years ago called Inner Space Times, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I think I've got about four test pressings of that, yeah. Oh, okay. That's one sentence of test pressing uh, of the full album, yeah. I, I remember I've sort of got them somewhere, yeah. But uh, initially, once we signed to a major sort of record label, they're probably in storage somewhere, the test pressings of um, a lot of the Buzzcocks ones, in terms of that, they probably, you know, sent them to us and they've probably got got them back to hold on to somewhere maybe you know yeah well no one held on to those back then they didn't see them no. as anything other than you know disposable yes it was like well that's okay you know it, it sounds good so continue you know you've got the permission to press them mm-hmm. so um um but i i don't remember any member ever having a, a test pressing as such or holding on to it you know probably what happened was um we had Martin Hanna, he pressed that, that he, he, he produced that spiral scratch. But the other records, Martin Russian, he probably would have kept the test presses. We would have probably listened with him, and then he would have kept, or the label would, United Artists, you know. Quite often we'd come from Manchester to London, we'd just signed a record deal, and um, we recorded orgasmatics and stuff, and we'd go to the office and. Um, the test pressing would be there to listen to, so it was probably left in the archives of um, World well, United Artists, and then it became EMI, so it was always with listening in the office, really, rather than personally at home, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it was always left there, you know. It probably went in a skip bin in the early 80s. Could well have been, because when we was on EMI, you know, even the balcony of the building where the Beatles locked down, I mean, that got chopped off and put in a canteen in another EMI when it moved. And then I'm not sure but it exists. You can't believe it. Record companies, you know, so careless with some of the presses stuff, you know. (laughs) But they may exist somewhere. Well, hopefully, (laughs) hopefully, hopefully that gets unearthed somewhere. Now, with Spiral Scratch, there were four songs on there uh, Breakdown, Mm. Time's Up, Boredom, and Friends of Mine. Um, Mm. But at that time, you'd been playing live. You had songs like Orgasm Addict and a few others. Mm. Was was that ever considered to be on Spiral Scratch? Or why were these songs selected? 
Hey there, all you record nerds. I want to tell you about BagsUnlimited.com. BagsUnlimited.com has a huge selection of vinyl record supplies. Whether you collect LPs, 7-inch singles, 78 shellacs, or anything in between, BagsUnlimited.com will sort you out. From polyline sleeves to cardboard record mailers to 7-inch storage boxes and archive quality record sleeves, protect your records of any size and shape at BagsUnlimited.com. Whether you have a small personal record collection or you're running a massive record shop, you can grab a small supply or even buy in bulk at BagsUnlimited.com. And they've got some really incredible, unique stuff. BagsUnlimited.com even has special size sleeves made especially to protect your box sets, storage boxes and sleeves for cassette tapes, protective supplies for reel-to-reel, and yes, even 8-tracks. Just go to BagsUnlimited.com, click on Audio Supplies, and prepare to be impressed by all the options they have. That's BagsUnlimited.com. At that time you'd been playing live, you had songs like Orgasm Addict and a few others. Mm. Was was that ever considered to be on Spiral Scratch, or why were these songs selected? Well, they, they, they seem to kind of work, as, you know, as the sequence that it was there. And, um, you know, so... I think Orgasmatic was in line for being the next single. Because um, you're right, it was there at the beginning. But um, th- those four songs on Spiral Scratch seemed to make sense, seemed to work, you know, because I suppose the prime thing was, and the message was boredom, you know. That was like, felt like a catalyst, <laughs> along with Anarchy in the UK and White Riot from The Clash, where we saying boredom, you know. Which is like an existentialist thought in a way at the time. People, French existentialists used to write about boredom and stuff like that. So, um, you know, that works and, you know, time's up and breakdown all seem to fit in well. So, um, friends of mine, sorry. And um, so that worked. As, but also, we were thinking, well, the next one should be orgasmatic, you know. And that's when we signed to a major record. Mm-hmm. Uh, company United Artists. Did United Artists have any challenges with Orgasm Addict at the time? That probably would have been slightly controversial. Yes, yes, they did. Um, well, we went with United Artists because a guy called Andrew Lord. He um, he came to see us many times, and um, we had offers from like six. Down in the woods, we had offers from six major record companies. We thought if we took the Spiral Scratch demo into Get a Deal, they'd laugh us out of the building because nobody had heard this kind of stuff at the time. And as soon as we put Spiral Scratch out, then um, um, we got offered, all, you know, six major record companies offered us deals. <laughs> <laughs> who else? That's besides, the irony of it. besides United Artists, who else was coming to take you to dinner? Oh, you know, um, yeah, CBS and... Um, all, all the other major record companies that were around at the time, you know, there was six of them rolling up offering deals, you know. Did Richard Branson, labels. Richard Branson, come up at all? Um, I think he was. Yeah, I'm hmm. not sure how, how, how big Virgin were at this time, really. Uh, yes, I suppose it would have been. With, yeah, probably Richard Brett, all of them, and um, I know there's six of them. So uh, you know, probably Polydor and all these people. But I know where uh, CBS offered us open checkbooks and saying, don't sign to United Artists, all this stuff. But um, we thought this guy, Andrew Lord, it was, he would give us artistic control and sympathetic to what we're doing. And he'd come to quite a few shows to talk about these things, you know. So we thought, he understands it a bit. So then we we said, that, well, the first single is, we want is Orgasm Addicts. So he said, okay, so we recorded that. And um, then it went to the pressing plant. And the pressing plant wouldn't print it. You know, they, oh. they, they said, you know, I said, put a release date in the papers in the enemies and sounds and melody maker at the time. Buzz Cox are going to release this single orgasmatic. And then the pressing plant refused to press it, saying that. We're not going to press this, Phil. All gas and money. We can't be putting that on the record. <laughs> and so 
the release date was put back three weeks. Oh. Well, they negotiated that this was art. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, of all, of all the things, we didn't think the actual pressing plant would be refusing <laughs> to press it. Yeah. But also, so, like, the, the, the cover of the single, it's a, there's a bit of nudity, semi-nudity on there. So that may have been something that uh, raised the eyebrow, too. Well, there was that as well. There was the lyrical content, and then there was the visual thing of a, a kind of woman with an iron on her head, really, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that was definitely art, you know. It's, uh, it was like a collage, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, about, you know, using a, a woman as uh, an object, you know. Um, yeah. It was like an internet, making a statement that way. So I uh, suppose you put that all together, and they... Uh, they the, Shop floor pressing plant decided that that wasn't art, really. <laughs> How involved was the band in the artwork? So, for example, the, the cover of Orgasm Act or even the cover of uh, another music in a different kitchen. Were, were you guys across that? Were you helping design it? What, what was your role in it? Um, no, we there was a girl called Linda who was um, doing these collages, and um, we let her do that. You know, she she was already doing she was already doing some. Um, and uh, uh, different collages, and uh, there was like a brochure she made with uh, um, our fan club at the time was called Secret Public. So they made like this um, a sort of leaflet thing, like a, a, a gatefold leaflet thing of collages similar to the old Gasmatic um, um, uh, thing, and um, so. They were so rare. It was like it was like like, like the pop art colleges of the sixties in the fifties and sixties and did stuff like that. So, um, so we 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 gave her freedom to do it. Oh, she she made that um, the woman with the iron on her head to simplify it. She made that, and we liked it and said, "Let's put that on the front," you know. And um, so that's what happened. Really, we you know we gave her the. Uh, the cover to do that, yeah. Because if we liked him, we said, let's put that on. That, that looks fitting with old Gazomatics. And um, it looked new and modern at the time. Nobody was doing that kind of thing, you know, in that early punk days. So it gave it a distinctive thing, you know. Oh. And it opened up a lot of debate and, you know, controversies in ways. <laughs> Which I'm sure was a bit of fun for the band as well. I mean, you, you want to provoke... Especially, you know, a new artist. That's you know that that could work in your favor. Well, absolutely. I mean, the amount of people that come to the shows now, even that said, when when it was like fifteen or sixteen or whatever, they're playing that record upstairs in the bedroom, and the mum or dad had come up and uh, start going, "What are you listening to? Oh, get some what you know." And all that. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of parents that shocked at the time was unbelievable. You know. Uh, so, according to the fans, and of course the fan, the people that bought it when you're young, it was great to sort of upset your parents in that kind of way, you know. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So uh, the album, another music in a different kitchen. We'll talk about that, but let me ask you: Are you familiar with the Australian band Hard Ons? Uh, yes, not that familiar, but I know the name. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So they did a bit of a tribute. For another music oh, in a different kitchen, I don't right. know if you if you've seen that. Here's the the cover here. All oh, right, I've not seen that. No, no. They yeah. they ha shared that they are big fans of Buzzcocks, and this is a tribute to wow. that album. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, because didn't they did they do one like Spinal Scratch? Yeah, that, you know. Um, I, I know that they're 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 record collectors and they're music fans. And right. They they go very deep when it comes to their taste, and that album that cover is a tribute because that right. th I think they all all the members really loved that album, especially when they were growing up. So I tell you what, right. again, when you get to Sydney, I'm going to make sure you have one of those in your suitcase for uh, for the trip right. back home. Right. I mean, that's a great compliment, isn't it? That as well. And even the name, the Hold On, it's like. 
some correlation between that and the buzzcocks in a way. Isn't it? <laughs> it sounds, yeah. well, that's that's true. Sounds like it could have come from that somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> they they were. I'm sure they were influenced by the the uh, the muscle that provokes. Um, yes. <laughs> so another music in a different kitchen. This album. It was originally, it, it, there were a couple different pressings early on. The track I Need was left on some records, and some of them were pressed without that song on it. Do, do you recall that at all? Vaguely, yes. Because that kind of thing happened to a couple of other things as well, really, I think. But mainly that, yeah. Mm. Um, I don't know how these things happen. You kind of send things in, and then you can get roughly, you know, oh, Mistakes happen with it, yeah. Um, I remember that happening. I don't know whether I... Um, I don't know how many got out there, you know, but um, I haven't got one of those either, yeah. But um, they rectified that, you know, yeah. uh, eventually. But um, I think there but probably also some out there with the um, with the chat missing, you know. Um, yeah. So the way you tell, and this is for anyone listening who has a copy of an original UK copy of another music in a different kitchen, you look at side two, the track, the song I Need is on the label, it's on the cover, but it's not on the record. If you look at side two and there's four songs instead of five, then uh, you have a very serious collectible there. So that's the test. Well, also another thing as well, um, see, my, my first song was Fast Cars. I, that was mainly my song. I did all the music and the chorus fast cards. And I'm not credited on the first pressings of the album as well. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's it's to Howard and Pete, but no no Steve yes. around there. Yeah. And then um, on the next pressing, they changed it. But on the initial one, it's not that. Because I was going, that's my song. I mean, um, they wrote the verse. Well, I'd left my verses at home. And it was, I've done a rough demo of it, the music, fast cars. I hate fast cars. And because Howard was the singer at the time, yep. um, it was like, well, okay, you change the verses so it suits you, you know. Don't say, oh, but I, you know, they know it's my song, really, that. But when it comes to the uh, the pressing once again, and it's probably there with that missing track I need, <laughs> which is also my song with Pete. <laughs> um, <laughs> It just says Shelley DeVoto on the first present, where it should say Diggle Shelley DeVoto, which they eventually changed as well, you know. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to have to look at my copy upstairs to see which one I have. Yeah. If it, the, the original ones, I'm, I'm not credited on it. Luckily, I get my publishing for it, of course. But <laughs> That's um, important. <laughs> yeah, that's important. But yeah, and I was like, that's missing. And then... Uh, of course, um, the thing with I need as well, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, I'm interested to hear why in in an era where a lot of people in music, especially punk rock, were giving themselves these new names, these new personas. Uh, even mm. Pete, even Howard, they they altered their names. How did you get away with just using your government name straight out from day one? <laughs> Hey there, audiophiles. If you're seeking stylish furniture to showcase your stereo and record collection, well, look no further than SidetrackedWorkshop.com. Sidetracked Workshop designs extraordinarily elegant record cabinets and consoles that add sophistication and panache to your music hobby. Handcrafted in the good old USA in the vinyl-loving city of Portland, Oregon, Sidetracked Workshop's designs are a music lover's dream. Made with real walnut, veneered wood, and brass accents, these gorgeous designs add class and taste to the record room and ship fully assembled assembled and ready to enjoy. Just check out the designs for yourself at sidetrackedworkshop.com. Look, you spend thousands of dollars on records. Don't keep them in a crate and don't risk your records on those feeble wooden pegs from IKEA. Your music deserves the dignity of Sidetracked Workshop. That's sidetrackedworkshop.com. Elegant solutions for the vinyl lifestyle. <laughs> Oh, and hey, 
record nerds, don't forget to clean your records with the very best and safest record cleaner, the Groove Washer. Make your records look and sound their very best and store them with confidence using the new Groove Washer Groove Guard record sleeves. You gotta try this out. It makes a huge difference to the quality of your vinyl experience. Ask for the Groove Washer by name at your local record store and accept no substitutes. Or head over to GrooveWasher.com and use discount code Vinyl Guide 10. All hail the Groove Washer. That's GrooveWasher.com, discount code Vinyl Guide 10. In, in an era where a lot of people in music, especially punk rock, were giving themselves these new names, these new personas, uh, even Ooh. Pete, even Howard, they, they altered their names. How did you get away with just using your government name straight out from day one? Well, in the early days, we were talking, and Howard was saying he was going to change his name, and uh, Pete was. And they said, why don't you, you know, change your name? <laughs> and um, I remember reading this book by Jan Waynehead, uh, Lennon, Lennon Remembers, John Lennon. I remember reading this book about John Lennon, and he said, um, Bob Dylan's not Bob Dylan. He's Zinnerman, you know. That's who he is, you know. It was John, when John Lennon was going for that first uh, Plastic Ono Band album, that era. Right. And, um, you know, he said, my name's John Lennon. I wouldn't change my name. So when it comes to me, Pete and Howard had changed theirs. And I just remembered that, and I thought, I ain't changing my name to somebody else, you know. Right. And in some ways, it, they, people thought I made my own name up anyway. You know? yeah. <laughs> so yeah. did you have a runner-up? Were you Steve Danger? Did you try a few things, or were you... Always Steve no, Dillon from day one. Well, Howard, Howard used, when Howard left, he came to a, one of our gigs, uh, but on the guest list, we put Mole Rothman because he didn't want anybody to know that, um, you know, he was coming to the show kind of thing. He wanted to just kind of sneak in, watch the thing and go. So he didn't want his name on the guest list. Uh. <laughs> so he, I think we put him down as Mole Rothman. <laughs> <laughs> they smoke Mo Rothman cigarettes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I couldn't imagine myself being called Marcel Vogue or Mo Rothman or something like that, you know. I thought, I'm Steve Diggle, I'm going to stick with that. So I did, you know. <laughs> it's worked well for you. Now, did yeah. you? was there a bit of a competition between Buzzcocks and Magazine in the early days? Uh, not really, no, you know. Um, um, Howard left, which was... Amazingly, a great thing because he started the band with the descent shows and spiral scratch. Then we was a bit shocked. He left, but we, you know, we um, we actually uh, it it was a good thing really. I, I couldn't have seen where it was going to go after that. So, um, it was left to me and Pete. Then I sort of moved over to guitar, and that became the classic sound: the two guitars together and stuff. And um, magazine had their own thing, you know. Um, I I really like magazine, you know. But um, um, so there's no competition really. I I kind of think thought you got two bands for the price of one kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. It was like, well, you know, magazine are doing their own thing. But if he just stayed, then you wouldn't have had the bus coach that we know, you know, right. really, all the classic thing. You know, with hindsight, you think. That was the best movie ever made, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and personally, and everything, I think Howard wanted to do something else. But me and Pete really got on well, and um, also musically, you know, we could interpret what we were doing in terms of how it developed, you know. And um, it became a bit more melodic then, you know, um, mm -hmm. for us with like. Um, what do I get and stuff like that? Well, I, I had a demo cassette. I had this song called I Might Need You, Do What You Want, Don't Make Me Blue, just rough working words. But it was all about the eye, you know, I was going, but I might need, you know, it's just like duh, 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 duh. So I played this to Pete. And then a couple of days later, he said, I've got this song, what do I get? I said, it's not a million miles from my demo, you know. What do I get? Oh, you know, I might need you. You know, it was all about the I bit a little bit, you know. And uh, but that kind of inspired him to write that, and um, and we, be, you know, it became 
a little bit more melodic. When Sparrow's Crunch is a bit more jerky, you know, did, right. did, 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 that kind of thing. Um, you could see this sort of melodic side coming out. And I wrote this song called Promises and uh, with the music and the chorus. And once again, I left my words on because there's only demo in there, a piece. And I've got some words for the verses. As I was humming the melody. Da, 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 da. Um, so those kind of songs it took us into that melodic phase of Buzz Cox, you know. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time was the, the sort of avant-garde thing as well, where I did this song Autonomy, the name of the book, where because we was interested in like uh, crowd rock music and stuff like that and noise and avant-garde stuff, um, there was always that angular thing in Buzz Cox as well, musically. So um, we had... Uh, so I did this song Autonomy, which was, uh, I thought it was me pretending to be a German singing English. <laughs> yeah. So I was this, it was very weird when I was 20. So it, it, um, I was listening to Can and thinking, that's a German guy trying to sing English, you know. Because it's kind of going something like, I, I want your mother sky, that kind of thing. And uh, I thought it's kind of weird listening to them uh, sing a German trying to sing English. So I thought I'll pretend to be an English belt trying to be a German singing English, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm there with my guitar at home and I'm going like, I, I want you autonomy, you know. <laughs> and that's how I kind of got to the song. But musically it was interesting as well because... I just went straight down the neck as the intro of um, well, it has a little chug on the E, but uh, and then I went straight down the neck. I thought, let me think unconventionally, not just like a bunch of chords that you normally do, you know, chords and things. I just went all the way down the neck on most of the things and came. I thought it's the most like unconventional thing to do, really. Um. So I had that bit, and then um, um, I had to think uh, an inverted thing coming back of um, of um, of the riff, ding, 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 that kind. So I had a few things going on there. With, uh, in the punk rock days, that was all pretty unconventional, or a bit more avant-garde than your linear, straightforward song. Mm -hmm. So that few interesting things about it. And incidentally, a young Johnny Marr from the Smiths was listening. Yeah. Uh, went out and bought that album, and he said autonomy blew him away, uh, particularly the riff, you know. Uh, ding, da, da, ding, ding, da, 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 all that. And oh. um, and um, I think he's done some podcasts, uh, not podcasts, but some kind of, yes, some musical thing where he's, uh, where he's got that, you know, um, um, he's he's actually playing it himself. Going this this riff inspired me. And I thought that was the new sound of Manchester. You know, <laughs> um, so there's a lot of great things about that song autonomy. You know, and we also had one on the first album, Fiction Romance. Now Pete had some he had the chords going did 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 did, did. and um, I looked at him and I said, and I just did one note on it. So he went, da, 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 and I went, da, da, just one note. Without that one note in that song, the song just wouldn't really exist, probably. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I contributed one note musically to that song, but the most important note of the song, you know, so it was, da, 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 you know. Uh, That's right. Well, it's those details so that I think people really appreciate in Buzzcocks. And and, and yeah. it doesn't surprise me that that influenced Johnny Marr. I'm sure it had a big influence on Andy Gill and Gang of Four. Uh, a lot of people have taken a page from the Buzzcocks book that you guys wrote early oh, on. Absolutely. I mean, those are the idiosyncratic and mm -hmm. avant-garde or arty little bit of a sweetie, you know, because, like I say, we, <clears throat> we had the conventional things, like the promises, what do I get, the linear songs. But we also had those kind of things, you know. Mm -hmm. And also a thing like moving away from the pulse beat on that album too, you know. So there's quite a few avant-garde things 
on that album. Or, 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 or it, you know, it took punk rock to different places as well as the... Because the Sex Pistols are all in here, you know, it was straightforward kind of punk rock. And the classy first... <clears throat> excuse me, the classy first album was on Carnalini, but on our album, um, you know, we had the songs like I Don't Mind and Fast Cars and stuff, which kind of like straight forward ahead. But we had those other things, you know. So I think that, um, that took us in a different area, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, that was an important album, and probably my favourite one out of them three, really. Uh, the initial three we did. It, um, it still holds up so well. The the, the yeah. other album I wanted to talk to you about is Singles Going Steady, uh, mm. because that was uh, released, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was a compilation of the different singles uh, released mm. for the U.S. market because you guys were getting ready to tour and to mm -hmm. get people familiar with what they were going to be hearing. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what happened was, I think we'd had about eight hits in the charts of those singles. Uh, those singles were, um, you know, on the top of the pops here, the television charts and all that stuff. So it took us two years to get to America because we're so busy over here and in Europe. Um, and so it was time to go to America. And uh, um, we was on IRS, Miles Colpin's label at the time, going through... A&M records, and he had the police who were just starting out as well, you know, and uh, and uh, we kind of said like, um, we need to bring America up to date with uh, with um, um, with what you've been doing, really, you know, because I'm not sure what, how easy it was to get those singles at the time and uh, um, in America, and um, so it's like we better do this passage history of all, all, all the singles, bring Americans up to date. You've had all seven or eight hits in the charts, and they don't know, you know, we've got to bring them up to date. So that's why singles going steady was born. Now, people uh, people in America thought that was our first album, a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. which it was as a release. Yeah. But um, it wasn't our, you know, as you know, it was uh, another music in a different kitchen was the official. One, but um, uh, singles going steady came out first as uh, and, and they thought it was our you know uh, new album. I think. <laughs> yeah. Did Did you know how popular you were getting in America at the time? Well, well, we knew. Yeah, I mean, right from the beginning, we knew. You know, people wanted us to go to America when we started happening in Britain. But we we're so busy over here and so, you know, it had to be worked out and stuff. That's, um, you know, we left it for a long time, you know. But the yeah. great thing was um, um, we left it for, I think it was 18 months, two years at least, which seemed a long time for fans to wait and things like that. But the great thing when we when we went there and we... Um, we played two nights at the Irving Plaza and the Ramones came to see us. And in Los Angeles, we did the 6,000 at the Santa Monica Civic, which was a big gig at the time, you know. Um, and we did, a, you know, a few shows on the way. But um, so people were really glad to see us by the time we got there, you know. <laughs> and um, it, it wasn't that we didn't want to go. It was just that we were so busy and... It had to be sorted and organized, didn't it? Well, so, those those first two years, you did three albums and countless tours and all these singles. Mm. Yeah, no, I can totally see. Now, one one story that I heard is you once invited John Lennon to see Buzzcocks. Uh, is that yeah, true? Yeah. yeah, when I came close to that, yeah. I actually phoned the Dakota building. And, you, um, you phoned the Dakota. Did you have yeah. – how did you get that number? You just – Looked it up. Well, or? I I don't know how I got that number now, but I <laughs> I mean I had a we'd got to America. And I had a few drinks in the bar at the hotel, <laughs> and I said I'm going to phone John Lennon. Just <laughs> I'd heard that I'd been to a couple of shows somewhere or whatever, and I thought no harm in inviting him, you know. <laughs> so I phoned up the Dakota building, and amazingly I got through, you know, and I. 
I didn't actually. Well, they they sent they whoever I was whoever I, I spoke to went in and asked John, you know, about coming to the Buscox show. But well, they said, "Who is that?" I said, Steve Deagle from Buscox. I said, um, "You know, I live to you know, I live in Manchester, just down the road from Liverpool." Where John, so they thought it was a friend of mine, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I said he lived just down the road from me, you know, <laughs> which he did, or fifty miles away, but an hour. But um, not that I knew him. But um, so um, I, I, I uh, they got a message to to him, and um, he said, uh, John said, can you phone back in an hour, Steve, and all that stuff. <laughs> phone back in an hour. I'm just busy in a meeting with Yoko or something. So. I was blown away. I thought, fuck, I've got through. And he's, you know, he don't really know me, but he must have heard of the band, you know. And um, so I got as far as that. So after an hour, I didn't phone back, really. I should have. Done. I went back to the bar. <laughs> and, um, well, I thought it was a big step making the call, really. You know what I mean? It was so. Oh, God. And I, I, I kind of, um, I should have phoned back looking back. <laughs> but I just thought, oh, you know, can I be bothered? <laughs> oh, that's all right. Well, you know, we're going to be inviting Ringo to the Metro Theater in Sydney. So maybe oh, you'll nice. finally get it. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, well, I, I nearly got to meet Ringo as well. A friend of mine um, went to see Bruce Springsteen a few years back. And uh, I'm not sure what it was my birthday uh, around that time. So, um, we went to Wembley to see him. We're kind of backstage and stuff. And um, it was the band were going on, Red Springsteen and the DC band, and all was like we're going on. And we were in their dressing room. They'd gone and we'd, we'd, we'd missed the, we, we was in the East Street band dressing room and nobody was there because they was getting ready to go on. So some uh, commissioner or whatever, some security guy said, you know, you've got, I told me, you've got to go this way. So, I went out and I thought, I can't see anybody I was with. So I walked around, over and way around the top of the arena looking for where our seats were. And when I got to the seat, uh, my friend Teddy was going, where have you been? I said, well, they sent me out the other door. They said, I had a ticket, I had a seat next to Ringo Starr for you. And that was a surprise, you know. Uh. <laughs> Now Ringo watched a few songs and then he went. So by the time I got there, he'd gone. <laughs> oh, he had things well, to that's, do. That's two Beatles. Maybe <laughs> next up. Maybe next up, Paul McCartney. I've not met him yet. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll see if we can arrange it. Well, look, right. Steve, uh, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much for joining us here, and we're looking forward to seeing you here in Australia. Um, yeah. w watching you tour around, especially uh, playing with bands like Descendants yeah. and some of the other folks that are out there that I know are big fans of Buzzcocks and and uh, helping mm. share the, the music of Buzzcocks with a whole new generation. It must be something that's very satisfying for you, yeah? You know? Oh, it's amazing, the resonance of Buzzcocks, how it influenced a lot of people. From REMU to just every band I've met was like, was Cox inspired us to do what we were doing, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been an amazing influence. I mean, we've been doing our own shows in America and, and just recently. And like I say, we joined this Descendants for, for, I think, about six shows. But we've been out there for five weeks. And there was massive fans saying, will you play Autonomy? Will you play it? You know. So we had a great time with them. And then we did the No Effect Festival. They were big fans. And that was a massive festival. Is there sort of uh, they're finishing their final shows, so we just joined them at the end for that. Um, so it's been an amazing thing. And also, we got the new album out, Sonics in the Soul, which uh, came out about a year and a half ago. So that's been going down well on the tour as well. And the future plans is I've written another album, um, which was ready. In January, but then I've, I wrote it, and we've been on the road all year. I've not had time to record it. Yeah. I can't, I, at the beginning of the year, I thought there'd be a space to record this, you know, and um, 
there's just not been enough time. So I'm hoping in January sometime we can get in the studio and, and do this new album as well, you know. Wow. To carry on from the Sonics and the Soul Room. Because that's been going down well live, you know, which is great to, I think, keep the continuation. And now we've kind of got the wheels back on the wagon. I think it'll be important to keep putting out music as long as I can, you know. Oh, um, sure. This year you've got all those live dates. You have yeah. the book. Um, yeah. You know, a lot going on. So, yeah. A lot's going on, yeah. But there'll be a new album next year at some point, you know, which I know people enjoyed the last one. And, of course, we've got the great catalogue that we've been talking about. So, mm-hmm. And also, we're really looking forward to coming to Australia now and, uh, and New Zealand too. Oh. Um, we're looking forward yeah, yeah, to just, looking forward to having you. It's uh, the weather's yeah. warming up, so make sure you bring your board shorts. Is yeah. that, well, that's going to be good because I've just it's been really sunny in America, but here in Britain we're, we we've got cloud and rain. <laughs> <laughs> good. So we're looking forward to coming. I mean, it's going to be great. The band's on fire. Uh, everything's you know been going well, so. We're looking forward to it. Oh, Steve, uh, that sounds fantastic. I want to make sure that folks, especially in Australia, know that Buzzcocks are coming October and November of this year. Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Newcastle, Sydney, and Melbourne. Dates and tickets, ticket links are at buzzcocks.com. And, of course, pick up Steve's new book, Autonomy, Portrait of a Buzzcock. It's a fantastic read. Lots of behind-the-scenes stories and really interesting anecdotes around what led him through life of a buzzcock, the early years, the recordings, the sessions, meeting different people, playing with different folks. It's an amazing book. So again, you could pick that up wherever books are sold online. You could pre-order or sometimes you could even you maybe able to pick them up in the, in the shows. But again, Steve, we look forward to having you here in Australia and it's an absolute honor to have you on the Vinyl Guide. Man. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure, yeah. Man, what a lovely bloke. Thank you, Steve, for joining us here on The Vinyl Guide. Looking forward to seeing him and the crew uh, here in Sydney. I think they're playing on November 1 at the Metro Theater. Of course, anyone else here in Australia, uh, check out buzzcocks.com for tour dates and ticket links. And we'll see you at the shows. And that's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, I want to make a request. Please give us some positive reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Five out of five or ten out of ten stars. Say something nice. We always love hearing that. And a huge thanks to everyone who's sharing these episodes on social media. That is a huge help as well. Uh, We'll be back shortly with a brand new episode. So until we talk next time, get out there and buy some records, people. Cheers. Cheers.